Mark Ridis is an American singer, musician, songwriter and producer who's worked with a variety of different artists and is credited with writing more than five and a half thousand songs. And he's with us here today. How are you? I always answer I was a lot better in 1986. And I'm pretty sure it was a Wednesday. And later on, you will get the answer to why I always say that. Oh, well, I look forward to that. So first of all, can you just tell us some of the singers and acts that you've written songs for? Let's start from the beginning. Frankie Valli, Dion, Elvis Presley actually stole one. That's a whole other story. Um, Once I was signed to CBS Songs in 1980, that's when I started to get a lot of covers uh get out your vacuum cleaner because here comes the name dropping (laughs) barbara streisand barry manilow box of frogs featuring jeff beck aldo nova johnny mathis jennifer rush michael bolton mike cavanaugh there's just go to mark ready type in mark radice r-a-d-i-c-e wikipedia and it has it has them all yeah absolutely so how did you first get into writing music in the first place you know how like when kids they're outside and like my favorite baseball player a million years ago when i was a kid was ron swoboda so i pretend to be ron swoboda out in the baseball out in the yard playing baseball and here comes ron swoboda up to the plate 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 and then he hit ron swoboda hits home run and the crowd goes crazy right so but instead of baseball the Beatles came in to my life and everybody 1964 was it or 65 which made me 7 or 8 and I pretended that I wanted to be a Beatle but so did everybody in the world but I started to sing what I considered fake Beatles songs so I would be like riding my bike and going, the girl by the meter is looking at me with some love in her eyes, which was lovely Rita, meet her mate. So I was just making up <laughs> fake Beatles songs, so I thought. And then I found my grandmother's piano downstairs in the cellar where we lived in Newark. And I started to just hit all the notes and step on what I like to call the gas pedal, <clears throat> which makes it ring. So I would go, and just listen to it all, listen to all the notes. Eventually I discovered that, let me find a C. So I eventually discovered that the, all the white keys sounded good if you play every other one. So in other words, if I played C, E, G, B, or C, E, G, B, and just kept playing them up every other note. C, E, G, B, D, F, A, C, like that. It sounded cool, so I started actually teaching myself piano. I was like, oh, wait, these three chords, these three notes make a chord. The left hand is for bass. Cool. So I started making up the songs that I was writing on my bike. I started to find chords for them on the piano, and then one day my dad came down, and he's like, what you doing? And I was like, I'm making up songs. And I thought I was just making up songs. And then he looked at me, and he was like, these sound like real songs. So I kept doing it and I just kept doing it. And this was at at, at age seven. A lot of people struggle to ever get signed. So did it feel particularly lucky for you to get signed when you were only seven years old? My dad was a recording engineer in New York City. He did Jimi Hendrix and the Love and Spoonful and the Mamas and the Papas and the Cowsels and Vanilla Fudge. And you can look up Gene Radice on line and get his discography did i answer that question oh did you feel particularly lucky no i thought i was just making up songs but then and then i found the piano so he was a recording engineer and i was writing songs he took me to rca records to see if they would be interested and they were like these are songs these are not like little kid songs these are actual songs we, we put a band together and I got signed to RCA. Particularly lucky, I was like, I didn't feel lucky. I just felt like that's what I did. It'd be like if you were walking down the street and somebody pointed to you and said, look at that kid, he's walking at age seven. And I'd be like, doesn't everybody? Yeah. Well, do you remember what the first song you ever wrote was? It was called Wooden Girl. And it was about a puppet. 
And it went, oh, that funny wooden girl dancing in my head. Strings tied to her arms and legs, strings tied to her head. When she said she loves me so, like the way I feel, like to think about wooden girl, like to think she is real. I mean, just really distorted clavinet. You can find it on YouTube. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. So many famous people have recorded your songs over the years. So how did it feel to have well-known people like Frankie Valli and Barbra Streisand and Barry Manilow record your songs. It felt like I was finally going to make money. Back in those days, people bought records. You couldn't copy them. You had to go buy them. I had a couple of fairly decent years. Anything ASCAP check that had a comma. I remember my biggest one, I was probably 19. And it said $2,300. And I was like, what? I could buy a house. I could buy a town. I probably didn't say that. Yeah. So how did you get the chance to write for The Muppets and Sesame Street then? I was writing in New York City. I got signed to CBS Songs as a songwriter at the age of 25, something like that. Might have been 23, 24, but that's my final answer. <laughs> I was signed to CBS Songs and CBS at one point put out a February tape of all what they consider was their best unrecorded songs yet by their staff of songwriters and they put out this valentine tape that they sent out to all people who cbs songs had connections with that were potential artists looking for songs yeah and i had my song some good things never last which they particularly liked on that it was a cassette Believe it or not, they would send out cassettes. It's true. I'm 194 years old. <laughs> they sent out that cassette, and within about a half a year, Barbara Streisand heard it. Actually, her producer heard it, who was yeah. Phil Ramone. Phil Ramone, it's a whole other world and a whole other story, but he was pretty much the apex of my career. Phil got a hold of it and recorded it with Barbara. Some good things never last. And they tried a 60-piece orchestra with drums and all kinds and a tempo and a guy directing them and everything and Barbara said it's just not the feel of the demo and can we just get the guy who wrote the song to come out and they flew me out to LA wow. and I remember my friend at the time saying you're gonna meet Barbara Streisand what are you gonna wear and I was like what I'm wearing <laughs> so we get out there and uh, we did it in three takes I just what she needed was for someone to follow her singing it. It's three in the morning. Y'all know where in The field is more like, you know, sending the clowns. There has to be. So in three takes, we got, we got it. Wow. And I remember her listening back and listening back and listening back a whole bunch of times. And, and I looked over at her and I said, you're just going to keep white gloving this, aren't you? And she stuck her tongue out at me. <laughs> and I knew from then on that we would be friends for one whole day and I haven't seen her since. <laughs> Phil was also working with the Muppets. So after Barbara left and we recorded Some Good Things Never Last, I hung out with Phil in the studio. I forget which one. He said, do you have any other songs? Because let's hang out and listen to some. And of course, I brought probably a hundred of them. And back then, I would say I probably wrote a thousand of them, maybe two thousand. There was there's thirty years of my life. What am I? Is my voice breaking? There's thirty <laughs> years of my life where I wrote an average of a hundred songs a year. Wow. Why I don't know, but <laughs> well, back in the day, you could sell them, and I thought that's what we would be doing. But it's. 2021 and you can't sell anything anymore i spent about three four five six hours just playing them songs and stuff and then we got really interested in me as a songwriter and started oh man started i got a johnny mathis cover from him and then he had to work with jim henson and he wanted to introduce me to jim which he did so that's how i started writing with the muppets that was the muppets that was 1990. yeah and you went on to write the songs for the muppets at walt disney world did you get a particular brief when you worked on that project no i wore the same i'm not going to go there <laughs> i was flown out to la and i was actually the best way to do this with anybody is to be involved 
as they're shooting and then a song comes up. So I used to love conversations with Jim Henson because he would come up to me and go, Mark, Gonzo and the Chicken are on a laundromat. They think it's a ride. It's underneath Disney. They're in the washing machine. I need a song for that. I'm like, okay. Give me a couple hours. It really took maybe an hour. But I came up with, Love in a laundry mat. Who would have thought of that? Tossing and turning in his fancy machine. I can't believe it was love at first cycle. You sent me spinning if you know what I mean. And Martin, forgive me, last name. The director said it's a beautiful song and we can't do a damn thing with it. And I was like, what? It's just too pretty. So Phil... Magic Phil Ramon came in and he just made it and he made it way more Muppety. So that's... I didn't get a brief. I was actually involved in it during the shooting, which was, you know, and I wouldn't even know what the next song was for like four days. And he'd be like, okay, we need uh, Dr. Teeth and the band is playing at Disney World and they need a song about all the different music in the world so i wrote rock and rolling around the world rock and rolling the world around like that that's how that went wow that hurt i haven't been singing in a while so how does writing songs for the muppets compare to writing more serious songs well i write a lot of silly songs i wrote if bees were V's and V's were B's, then I'd be in love with you. So it was kind of easy to write sillier songs. They're, they're silly. They're, they're more fun. They were more fun back when writing was fun. Now, to me, a song is a series of technical and creative difficulties that have to be solved one at a time over long periods of time until eventually after maybe 8 to 12 hours the song is done and you can either put it up on the Spotify abyss which is 60,000 songs a day I'm not kidding that's how many get uploaded wow. or YouTube where it just sinks into the YouTube abyss they're silly is the, the two word answer you really want it <laughs> they're sillier <laughs> they're, they're very easy I have absolute pitch so I can see pretty much a script like a Muppet script sometimes like with Sesame Street they'll send me other writers, script writers, will write their own lyrics. And I pretty much, like, uh, I wrote Elmo's Ducks. So with uh, Santiago, I uh, God, forgive me, guys, but he sent me, Elmo had four ducks, four birds of a feather. So I'm like, I, I look at the script and I just, just put the mic on, like I'm doing now, and I'll look at the script and go, Elmo had four ducks, four birds of a feather, two water with and quack together and then once I have that my theory is if you can sing the song without any instruments it's a good song to it's easy to remember yeah if you need instruments to sing the song it's too hard to remember yeah. example row 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 your boat gently down you don't need any instruments for that do you no you just hear it so then a lot of Muppet songs once I got that epiphany Muppets and Sesame Street songs if you just sing the melody into a workstation and then add the instruments later that's how that's how you do it yeah for sure so obviously you didn't know this at the time but the muppets at walt disney world would turn out to be one of the last productions that jim henson ever worked on so does it feel particularly special to have written the songs for one of the last times we heard him sing working with jim was always special for everyone who was around him. Mm. He's, if I could put in the top three people that influenced my life, my father, Phil Ramone, and Jim Henson. Wow. And I didn't work long enough with Jim. Three days before he died, I was in New York City with him. And we were going to start working on French-speaking cockroaches. <laughs> don't ask me. I don't know. I didn't. I, I felt special all the time is the answer to that question. Yeah. So what have been some of your favorite projects to write for? If you want to step out of the Muppets, I would say Cheap Trick was my most fun 
ever. And by the way, that goes back to the very first question, how are you today? The answer was, I was a lot better in 1986 and I think it was a Wednesday because that was the day I came home from finishing Standing on the Edge. I co-wrote 16 songs with Cheap Trick and they used eight out of 10 of them on that record. I came home with the demos. I I loved it because I was a Cheap Trick fan forever and I was at my brother's apartment. That was the 1986 when I felt way better than How Are You. Uh, Michael Bolton was fun funny he has a very funny sense of humor we wrote a particular ballad once but we didn't finish it in new york city and he went home he came back to new york the next day for to finish the song we're working on and it was like this sad ballad i he said i played it for my wife last night and she started to cry wow. and i said to her is it that bad <laughs> <laughs> That's Michael. Yeah. So what have you been up to more recently? Do you have any projects that you've been working on? Trying to keep sane. Just go to YouTube and look up Mark Rudis. And I need subscribers because I still don't have a thousand subscribers before I can monetize anything. Yeah. Well, as well as that YouTube channel, is there anywhere we're able to keep up to date with you on social media and websites, etc.? Well, I'm in a small town in Tennessee, so if you want to call me, my number is five. (laughs) Okay, I made that up. But I do have a Facebook page. Facebook, YouTube, I have the YouTube channel. You can just type in Mark Reddice in YouTube, and it's very easy to keep up with me because most of the time I'm sleeping. (laughs) I'd like to quote Bob Hope here, who at the age of 80 said, I don't usually feel anything until around noon, And then it's time for my nap. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. It's been great having you here. Thank you, Toby. It's been a pleasure to virtually meet you and continue success. Mark Radice, over and up.